Hello. Welcome to the Judge Ben Show. My name is Ben Joseph. I'm a retired Vermont trial judge. This is a program in which I interview people about subject that relate to issues in Vermont law. Um, today is December 17th as we're recording this. Um, I've already interviewed one person today about uh, the legal aspects of the Cannabis Control Board. And now I'm going to interview Catherine Antley, a physician who's uh, here. Uh, she's a member of the Vermont Medical Society. We're going to talk about the things that the society has proposed that relate to the advertising and sale of uh, marijuana or cannabis, as uh, the proponents like to call it, um, that's going to start in 2022. Um, Catherine has been very much involved with this for a long time, really, and knows a lot about uh, what might be done to uh, control the harms that can be caused by the increased use of this drug. What do you think? Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, yep. it's a pleasure to have you here. What would you like to <clears throat> tell the public? I think, um, I think maybe we should start with some, go through the slides, and it sort of gives a background about where the doctors, the perspective of the physicians coming approaching this issue. All right. Um, I think, you know, as a summary, uh, physicians want Vermonters to be informed decision makers. Mm -hmm. So if you're a consumer, that you are an informed consumer, so you can make informed decisions. And um, You might even make a decision not to consume. Um, it, it's appropriate to know the risks. Okay. If you, if it's for sale in your state mm -hmm. um, and and as communities to make decisions about whether they're going to have um, this you know um, shops selling a cannabis drug in their town or not it's important for them to know what the ramifications of that might be um, and some of which they may have no idea so this is um, the the physician's perspective I think is very um, different from what the public sees generally um, we're informed as a public. We're informed by advertising, by what's on the internet. We're we are influenced by all these things. Mm -hmm. Physicians who interact with the public, who are now, as you'll see, consuming in Vermont because <coughs> it is legal. Um, so their perspective is different. They see um, we're not the talking problems. about the physicians as consumers. We're talking about people they deal with as patients, right? Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Although, I mean. Um, it, it's, um, yeah. Okay, so um, if we're, we're going to go to the slides. Okay. And the first question is sort of why, why are we talking about cannabis now that um, Vermont has already, you know, decided to commercialize? Aren't mm -hmm. we once and done? Well, no, not really. Um, the first thing that informs us is we look at the 2019 um, USD, uh, sorry, NSDUH survey which is a nationwide survey, and there's Vermont number one in past use, um, you know, rate of marijuana use. Um, those is that percentage of the population using this. That's stuff? right. So now, you know, those first three, Vermont, Oregon, Colorado, flip around a little bit, but mm -hmm. we, 2019, number one. So this is, when we wrote the resolution, this is concerning. <laughs> Why is it concerning? Well, obviously, we have a number of issues. Um, that, that we're seeing in the ERs and in our urgent cares and otherwise. Mm -hmm. Psychosis, suicide, old ideation, um, the scrobbing, which is the screaming and vomiting, because it's not just a vomit, it's a painful, it won't stop, it goes on. If I guess if folks follow, saw the video, mm -hmm. um, you see people in a, a really extreme pain mm -hmm. um, and sometimes get hooked on opiates later to deal with the pain, which is an, an another problem. Mm -hmm. You can get seizures, cardiovascular, um, uh, you know, obviously motor vehicle accidents, um, and, <clears throat> uh, and so it, addiction. Um, so there are a number of, of issues that we are seeing. Mm -hmm. So we focused on 15% THC. You might say, well, why? Why, do, why does uh, the medical society care about the potency? You know, once it's there, it's there. And actually, the reason is, we'll just go through this slide a little bit more carefully. Um, in Holland, which has had a liberal um, uh, cannabis um, policy for a very long time, about 10 years ago, they proposed first this idea of limiting everything above THC. 15% is a hard drug. And there's science to that. Um, 
should be considered a hard drug like cocaine, according to the, the Dutch. Well, why is that? What they saw was as the potencies increased, there's a lag time, but then later on, um, as, that, uh, that, as that increase um, it gets manifest in the pet population, you see an increase in psychosis and ER visits. So, so, um, so this was the first indication that we're, we're dealing with a, di a different drug when you're getting up to 60% or 30%, which is double this. And I think it's important to realize that in Colorado, when they voted, in California, when they voted, it was a population level vote, right? And so they were voting on what they experienced in the 70s and 80s, which was very low potency. So people, individual people, not doctors, not physicians, not scientists, were making this decision based on their largely their own personal experience or sort of the libertarian view if someone wants to use no big deal. What happened after that vote was that the concentration of THC has gone up to, to concentrations that are really almost unprecedented. So that now a large percentage of the um, cannabis that's sold in Colorado is the super high potency THC. And it's, there's a reason for that. High THC, high concentration THC creates addiction um, more quickly. In, in, in individuals. We know that from science. Um, and so because um, just, you know, 80% or more of the, of, the, of the THC that's sold, of the product that's sold, is consumed by just 20% or less of the consumers, the industry is very invested in creating consumers who have a use disorder. So this high potency THC fits right into the industry playbook, but it has serious problems for the population in terms of the, the side effects. This is a great slide that was, I'm sorry, that last slide was uh, created by um, Dr. Libby Stout, um, from a psychiatrist from Colorado. And this one is by Dr. Bertha Madras, and it is a, um, an excellent slide, it has a lot of information. One thing <clears throat> I want to point out is that this is in, in Europe. So in Europe, they looked at different, um, in, um, uh, locations and the places that had high potency THC had more cannabis induced psychosis. Less potency, if your average potency in your city is low, you have less psychosis. And this was a very well done study, very powerful. And uh, their conclusion was in Amsterdam um, if high potency cannabis use were no longer available. So if you can roll back the clock 10 years or so, wow. which is not that far, right? Mm -hmm. And you can get rid of the high potency THC. 50% of, um, of the first episode psychosis could be prevented. So right now in, the, in Vermont, we're having a crush in the ERs. We have you know, weight people being warehoused in ERs for not just hours, but days. Oftentimes adolescents, oftentimes for psychiatric reasons. Now, we have, Vermont has, the highest use in the nation, 2019. If the highest we, percentage of people using the drug? That's right. And if we are, if the United States uses more than other countries, mm -hmm. which is at least conceivable, mm -hmm. it's possible that we're the highest in the nation, in the world. We're certainly up there. So, <clears throat> so this study showed that 50% of those ER visits for first episode psychosis mm -hmm. or uh, presentations for first episode psychosis would be prevented. And I would postulate that that's probably true in Vermont just because of our high use rate that we have documentation of. Well, it's in the interest of the people who are selling this stuff to, to create consumers who are addicted to the drug. Who, consumers who develop a use disorder, yes. Yep. Well, if, if they're addicted and they, they, they simply must be using it, they're more likely to have bad consequences. Isn't that right. right. I mean, um, what, you know, if you have a use disorder, that means you use even though your health is impacted. That means mm -hmm. you use even though your husband, wife, or child is impacted adversely. Yeah. You use even though you can't pay your rent. You use even though you need to drive your car or truck. So it's, you know, you use even though you need to do a responsible job. So use disorder means you're using even though there are problems in your life that are documented. Okay. So that's, um, it, and that's, and those, you're right, those 
folks who suffer from a use disorder are the um, consumers that the industry is interested in creating. And it's been documented that they can create um, because the high potency THC is more addictive. Right. Okay, so this I think is a really important slide. Um, this is a new article that came out in March, and it's by um, Dr. Volkoff. And one of the things that it showed is that in teens, they're demonstrating, in a very well done study again, that for teens, um, marijuana can be as addictive as opioids. Now that is a super sort of new thought, and Opioids, it's a we're talking about heroin and cocaine? The pills, I, yeah. you know. Um, okay. so, so that's a very powerful statement. It's a very concerning statement. It's, uh, it's kind of a scary statement, I think, in my opinion. Um, but I think it's important for us to recognize that our teens are very vulnerable mm -hmm. to, to, uh, creating, for the, to the creation of a use disorder. So, <clears throat> so you have high potency, which is going towards use disorder. You have targeting children or youth, if possible, which is also a use disorder. Now, <clears throat> the other um, issue is a couple other articles have come out. Cannabis use increases the frequent the risk of developing opioid use disorder. We know that the predominant predictor of op of an adult opioid misuse is having marijuana having used marijuana before the age of 18, and the number one risk factor for adolescent opioid use is ever having used marijuana, and that's the YRBS 2022. Well, and what, what kind of treatment is, is possible? Just tell them to be abstinent, or well, I think that's you know that's an issue. Uh, I mean, they have lots of lots of treatments out there, and and um, but I think one of the issues is that your environment really affects whether you will have success uh, in recovery. So if you have an environment where you smell it, if you have an environment where all your friends are using, if you have an environment where you go by the place where you bought it every time or you see the person who sold it from you, then those triggers all make it you know, more difficult. And so in a place like Vermont with very high use rates and very high, there's also a diagram that the health department um, has um, that I've seen that shows not only is our use rate high, but also our perception of harm is not going up, but going down. So we have this paradoxical situation in Vermont, wow. and actually all over the country, where use is going up, and mm -hmm. the consequences of use are going up, but the public's perception continues to what go down. What accounts for that? Okay, that, um, so we've talked a lot about the social determinants of health. Social right. determinants of health are, if you if you you know have poverty, if you've been sexually abused, if you've been you know ha suffered child abuse, if you you know don't have enough to eat, um, these things are 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 a series of twenty questions or so you can give to any group of people, and the results of that quiz will can predict those people's lifetime, um, so their life expectancy. So you'd think that taking their blood and seeing if they have high cholesterol or if their dad had um, you know, colon cancer would be a high predictor. Mm -hmm. But this is the social determinants of health, given the simple quiz, can give you an indication of who's at risk for health problems. Wow. So this is a powerful thing. We're talking a lot about that in the legislature chair right now. And people are trying to make changes that's very, uh, very admirable to decrease poverty, to dec decrease all these things, and to increase things like a trusted, um, a trusted adult is, would counteract that. So this survey looks at you know, positive and negative um, predictors of health. So that's important. What we're not talking about in Vermont, which is very important, is the commercial determinants of health. And the commercial, there's, a, there's a, a literature on the commercial. I just heard this term a few months ago, about a month ago. Um, but you can actually do a literature search on the commercial determinants of health. This is, this is a, you know, a body of work. And I think the answer to your question is, why is the perception of harm going down as our harm is going up, is because the commercial determinants of help, health trump um, you know, knowledge of, of, the, of the risks, knowledge of the risks that the Vermont Medical Society is trying to get out there. So I think that's, 
And that means the advertising, the internet, um, well, the political, what you hear. Well, is he, are you suggesting that the medical society could be sponsoring advertising on the subject? <laughs> I don't know. But I think that someone, uh, be it, would be, idea, it would be nice. You know, I mean, we have a new infrastructure bill. So it would be good if we spent some of that on the social determinants of health and countering the you know, cor corporate determinants of health. This next slide is really important, too. I want to, um, so this is, right now Vermonters are um, confronted with, you know, are we going to put um, cannabis drug stores in our town? And, um, and they're being informed um, largely by folks wishing to sell it, sure. right? So the local person who wants to open up a shop is putting out a lot of, he's investing, or she, a lot of money in advertising or hiring lobbyists to put his, their message, sure, her message, out. And this is an example, yes to question number three, is, is from one of these lobbyists who put it out there. And I'll just read it for you. While, while, so they're saying, you know, one of the questions that folks bring up is, is um, uh, youth use rate. And they say, well, this is uh, well-intentioned. Every study ever conducted in any, stu any state on underage cannabis use following legalization has concluded that legalization does not lead to an increase in underage cannabis use. So this is what we have on the right-hand side of the screen are three excellent, large, um, powerful studies mm -hmm. which demonstrate the opposite. So here we have an example of where the public is being informed by people who wish to sell to them. Mm -hmm. And the science is largely unknown. It's, it's obscure it's in, and it's not being uh, reported. Now, you might ask, well, why is that? And there are a couple of things. When you have a vote, all of our government employees in Vermont, people who worked for the state of Vermont and, or federal government, largely withdraw from, from engaging active. They don't put ads on the radio saying, hey, do you know that you know, if you have a marijuana drug shop next to your kids, they're more likely to use? Like, they won't put that kind of counter to someone who's wanting to open up a shop. Um, so when there's a vote, people in government generally step back. And those health departments, that's our content experts. So who do, we rely, who do we rely on? And the other issue is, you know, f who do we rely on to inform the public? So the other issue is um, that we have a lot of nonprofits who are experts. So our prevention professionals, um, and they, you know, because they're nonprofits, they re are to rely on grant money, they're often 501c3s. Mm -hmm. 501c3s risk their grant funding. So if you are 501c3, you may risk your funding, risk your job if you stand up and say, I want to tell you the facts about a marijuana drug shop next to your kids or within 500 feet of your school or less than, you know, less than 500 feet of a um, daycare or playground. Um, so I think this is part of the reason um, why the corporate determinants of health in this situation are trumping, are, are really overshadowing, overpowering um, the content experts in this field. So this, is, this brings us to, you know, why did we do this? This is our warning, Vermont Medical Society warning on THC may cause psychosis, impaired driving, addiction, uh, suicide attempt, uncontrolled vomiting, and harm to a nursing baby or developing fetus. And importantly, psychosis and, and suicide or self-harm can occur in individuals with no previous history of psychosis or mental illness. Um, we're seeing in Colorado, um, you know, this high potency THC that they didn't vote on. So now they're sort of rebelling. You know, the, the, the people are saying, whoa, my kid is sick. Legislators' kids are psychotic. Legislators' kids are schizophrenic, from marijuana, people who would otherwise be well, talented, attractive, um, young, you know, young people. And so they're angry. And so they've passed this bill, you know, we need to look at the high potency. And this is part of, you know, Chris Rogers, the medical director for the Child and Adolescent Services in one of their hospitals, psychiatric hospitals. He says, you know, person after person refuses to accept that marijuana could be bad for them. How could it be? They're taught to believe this is a harmless plant. And yet, you know, uh, they're just seeing tragic, um, repeatedly treat kids who are too psychotic to know what's real, 
who they can trust or where they are. The rates of adolescent psychosis have risen steadily since legalization. So that's so, because it's, it's being, more of it's being used and what's being sold legally has higher contents of THC than were available in, in the past. Is right, that right, right, right. And the regulation that was promised mm -hmm. hasn't happened. Yeah. So we're having um, kids who use, are using very high potency THC, which they really shouldn't be getting their hands on. Um, they shouldn't be getting their hands on any of it, but they're using very high potency and then they're getting very sick. But another important thing that the medical society said, this is not just a kid problem. In other words, um, you know, part of the, the studies that inform that cannabis causes, you know, is, is linked to the development of, of psychosis are hundreds. Like, they're, they're numerous studies. And it fulfills the Bradford Hill criteria for causation, which we use for tobacco. You can't, you know, take a group of kindergartners and divide them in half and give half tobacco and half not and see which ones yeah. develop, um, you know, lung cancer or the same thing with THC and, and psychosis. So you take a number of things that if you give them higher doses, do they develop quicker? If you give it to them when you're, they're younger, do they develop it quicker? Um, so you see over um, all these different studies and you can come to the conclusion, as we did with tobacco, mm -hmm. that there is a link to this disease. And that's the sort of, of really clear evidence, medical evidence that we have the marijuana is associated with psychosis, and Vermont Medical Society really wants people to understand that. It's so curious <clears throat> that the public knows that that abuse of this drug and high high potency of the drug hurts people. I mean, people people don't they do they understand? You think the public doesn't really grasp? This? No, no, I don't. In fact, I've heard a proponent say, you know, people will use use less because it's more. Potent, and that's that's just yeah. No, it ha it's it's a lie. You know, it's not true. But we're seeing, we're seeing um, dis you know dissembling type statements quite a lot. Here's the summary for the uh, cannabis hyperemesis project, which I hope you'll show the uh, video maybe again after this. Mm -hmm. um, and this is I just wanted to go through again. This is why the medical society is concerned. Before we had legalization, I heard Dr. You know, one, one of the legislators get up in the, uh, you know, um, in the legislature and, and, and give a, a talk about why they were voting no because, you know, they said the, the hospitalization rates would go up and the medical society put that information in our resolutions out, the, those uh, ER w visits would go up. And indeed now, you know, here, this was 2014. Mm. What we predicted came true, 2021. Now we're seeing kids in mental health care waiting for days in the emergency room in the digger, but there's no mention in five different articles that this could be related to cannabis. And so then, I'm getting back to your point, why is it that we're seeing more harms medically, but mm -hmm. the population is, is not aware it's, or not it making the link? baffles me. And this is one where we, you know, wrote and said, please add this, you know, to the reporter. And he said, oh, no one in the state is talking about cannabis as part of a psychosis or part of mental illness. And so the head of, you know, Vermont Department of Mental Health, Child and Health, Health not Family Division, wrote back and said, as someone who works on call in the psychiatric inpatient units and in emergency room, I can tell you the cannabis plays quite a large role in why people go to the EDs and the hospital. The, the Department of Health and the Department of Mental Health are also well aware of the role cannabis is playing in psychosis and suicide. And, of course, the, the ER is crowded with people who are there because of the Pandemic. I mean, it's, it's not coming at a good time. It's certainly not coming at a good and time. And quite frankly, I didn't have time to put this in there, but there's a new article that I discussed um, via email with Dr. Levine, which shows that f if you're using cannabis, you will not have as strong a reaction. In other words, you, you, your immune system won't react positively to the um, um, vaccines if you're using cannabis, you don't mount oh, as strong, that. That, that, yeah, that's a new article that's come out. And I think, you know, you could speculate that may be impacting, clearly people should know, you know, that yeah. if you're smoking marijuana, it may prevent or impede your, your immune system from mounting as robust a, a response uh, to the vaccine, COVID vaccine, as you would otherwise. Mm. Um, this is just showing that even a little bit of marijuana uh, apparently affects the 
thickening of the of the uh, prefrontal cortex in mm -hmm. children or in teens. Um, it affects your head. It affects it. it, it well, the, the point is, it affects <laughs> the it, anatomically. Mm -hmm. So they're taking an MRI picture of the brain over time, mm -hmm. and they're following. It's a large study, mm -hmm. and they're and it's low potency, um, and they're they're seeing that the prefrontal cortex prematurely thins, and along with that, there's changes in these behave in these kids' behavior, which is controlled for the social determinants of health that we were talking about. Mm. So um, we have the highest use rates in the, in the United States. We're experiencing those consequences, like, for, so for example, the ER overutilization. We haven't talked about health care costs. The Green Mountain Care Board is looking into this. Mm -hmm. But you know, have, do we need to call the Green Mountain Care Board and, and have a, a lecture with them, too? I don't know how much mm -hmm. they're following this topic. Um, addiction, of course, is expensive. Decreased perception of harm impacts all levels of Vermont society. Um, and it's a driver for increasing marijuana use. So uh, this is just an example of what the Colorado um, Child and Adolescent Psychiatric Society came up with. Mm -hmm. And this is our uh, recommendation. Um, we want everyone to be aware. Mm -hmm. um, cannabis THC may cause psychosis, impaired driving, addiction, suicide attempt, uncontrolled vomiting, farm, harm to fetus and nursing babies. So we want something that every school nurse can show to their class. Mm -hmm. um, and that every you know physician can can show to their patients. So this is I'll, I'll end with this slide. This is just as a sort of side by side. On the left, you see what the cannabis control board warning, what they're recommending, and on the right, you see what what the medical society is. And he says there's a lot more that can be done than just trying to pack a whole bunch of information on a tiny little label. And um, so um, I think what's important is that. For example, on their label, they say um, can be habit forming, and ours say um, can cause addiction. So addiction is something <clears throat> that you know when you have a use disorder, you continue to use even though you may lose your job or your wife or your husband or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, habit forming, brushing my teeth is habit forming. It, taking a <laughs> taking a walk with a loved one is, is habit forming, or mm -hmm. you know spending time with your dog is habit forming. So we feel like this is an, really an inaccurate, an in, in, uh, adequate warning. Mm -hmm. um, it does not mention psychosis, which is a recognized. Um, but the, the, the wordy thing on the left on the slide has been approved by the Cannabis Control Yes, Board? that's the recommendation to the legislature. Oh, my God. So we really would encourage, you know, if, <clears throat> if you're a Vermonter, if you use or you don't use, but if you feel like it's important, for Vermonters, all Vermonters use and not um, to know the risks um, of psychosis, suicide, um, suicide attempt, uncontrolled vomiting, harm to youth. Please, you know, call the Cannabis C Control Board because these, these risks are not listed on their label right now. Catherine, I want to thank you so much <laughs> for coming in today. This has really been great. Um, and I want to thank all of you for looking in. Uh, pl please consider what uh, Catherine's proposing here. I think there has to be a better understanding of the dangers involved with the use of this stuff. Whether you want it sold or not, there should be a, uh, an effort made to warn people about what, what, this is, what this involves so that they can make an educated choice as to whether or not to use this stuff. And uh, it's, it's really, a, it's, it's such a, a very major, it's a major issue. It's going to really affect a lot of people. And how bad it is is going to depend upon how well people are educated about what they're getting involved with. Thank you all for looking in. I look forward to seeing you again sometime. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you.